I'm the Philosophical Bachelor and today I want to talk about Thoreau's Search for Meaning, which is a summary of Walden by Henry David Thoreau. I went to the woods because I wished to live deliberately, to front only the essential facts of life and see if I could not learn what it had to teach and not, when I came to die, discover that I had not lived. I wanted to live deep and suck out all the marrow of life," writes Henry David Thoreau in his well-loved book Walden. Walden chronicles Thoreau's life in the woods which began 10 years before the book's publication in 1854. In 1844, he left his family home to live in the forest near Walden Pond in Concord, Massachusetts. He was then 27 and remained there for 2 years, 2 months and 2 days. Walden was his second and final book. It was a commercial flop, taking five years to sell 2,000 copies. His first fared no better. 1,000 copies of A Week on the Concord and Merrimack Rivers were printed and Thoreau got to keep 700 of them. By the standards of the publishing industry, his neighbours and his peers, Thoreau would seem to be a failure. They may even have considered him to be a bum. Yet, 168 years later, Walden is one of America's most celebrated works of literature and Thoreau is considered an influential thinker of the 19th century. If you regard Walden only as a novel, it did not age well. His sentences, while in part rather poetic, frequently require rereading to make sense of it since its timber and structure belong to a previous age. It recounts events and places that will be mostly unfamiliar and worse, uninteresting to contemporary audiences. The world has since changed in drastic ways. In fact, my two earlier failed attempts at reading the book made me wonder whether the many glowing reviews were plainly wrong. This book was boring. I recently decided to try again, and I realised that while Warden has its faults, the problem laid primarily with me. It was I who was not ready for its lessons. Its slow pace is meant to provoke reflection. We are accompanying Thoreau on his journey and this journey is not one of great drama and climaxes. Not much happens, like in real life, rather like our lives. Thoreau, like us, had to worry over mundane details like balancing his expenses with his income, counting his pennies, and trying to make sure that he had some. Oftentimes, he just wandered about, observing the world around him, the forest, the pond, his few excursions to the village, the occasional human visitors, the more frequent animals he encountered, none of which were particularly memorable. So why is Walden worth reading? I want to offer a contemporary reading of his book. While I imagine that the book would be more resonant to his contemporaries, his message is still relevant today, at times perhaps even more so. Other readers may have other takeaways, but in this essay, I want to focus on two points that spoke to me most. Thoreau's anti-capitalism and his existential idea of living deliberately, of being in the moment. In the quote, Thoreau talks about his fear of regret, of one who has lived out his life and realizes that he had not, in fact, lived. Obviously, Thoreau is not talking about living in the literal sense of how one is still technically alive even if brain dead and kept going only by life support machines. He is talking about living with meaning, which then leads him to ask, what is the point of life? Were we put on this earth merely to work for say 45 years and then wait to die? The details may have changed since Thoreau's time, but the struggle remains the same. Thoreau interrogates these questions in the book's first and longest chapter called Economics. The scenario he paints is how one works for decades to pay off their mortgage on a home filled with things they do not need, just so as to keep up with the Joneses, following a path not of their own devising. Sounds familiar? The convention that has been placed before us seems to be something that we need to, that we have to conform to, but according to who? Most of us may not even realize that there is a problem, and for those who do, not many dare try to go a different way. So what exactly is this problem? The problem is, if this is what life is about, this cycle of work eats sleep so as to keep ourselves ready to work yet another day, what then is the point of living exactly? How many people try to find out what is it, 
that they actually need to survive and wonder why they need anything beyond that. How many people question what is it that they really want out of their limited years on the planet and then wonder whether abiding with their routine will get them there? How many give up their dreams in the name of pragmatism, living what Thoreau calls lives of quiet desperation? Do we work in order that we can live well or have things become so topsy-turvy that we live in order that we can work well? The funny thing is, we have come to accept the narrative that life is about our work, that meaning comes from our jobs, that we willingly sacrifice what is actually meaningful and worthwhile for it. And those are the lucky ones, the ones that have work that might possibly be meaningful. There are those whose work is a drudgery, who unwillingly drag their feet to work every day, sacrificing their youth and health to be ground up in the machinery of capital just to make ends meet. Why does Thoreau begin his book in such a way? He is trying to demonstrate the disquiet he feels towards the norms of his society, so that we can understand why he decides that this is not the kind of life he wants to lead and to take the somewhat drastic action of retreating to the woods. This is a man who believes that philosophy is not something you theorize over and discourse about, something reserved only for the realm of thoughts and ideas. He is one who considers philosophy in its original Socratic meaning of philosophia, literally a love of wisdom. He believes that philosophy is a way of life. It is something you do which is actualized in how you live your life in pursuit of wisdom. Socrates has said that an unexamined life is not worth living, and Thoreau is making this journey to the woods, away from the hustle and bustle of society, in order to examine his life, to investigate what is important, what is worth doing, and what really is required in order to live in a worthwhile way. Thoreau refuses to sleepwalk through life, like how many among the labouring masses seem to be doing. He wants to live deliberately. To be deliberate is to do things intentionally, to be aware, to be conscious and consider the steps one is taking and to act with purpose. He wants to find out the essential facts of life, what is truly important in life in order that he can then go pursue those things and not find out at the end of his days that his time on earth was simply wasted, that he had not lived. He wants to live deep and suck out all the marrow of life, to immerse himself in life, to relish all that life has to offer, to experience it intensely to the extent that is humanly possible. Yet his approach is not one of immersing himself in society. Among workers, for instance, like Simone Weil, who went to work among factory workers so that she could really understand what their suffering is like. Instead, he retreats from society, going to live in the woods near his village of Concord. He wants to reduce the noise in his life of babbling voices of the society of people around him so that he can better hear the sounds of nature. He tells us to simplify, simplify, to cut out the unnecessary in our lives so as to be better able to focus on the essential. Thoreau is clearly capable of exposition, which he amply demonstrates in the first chapter of Economy. But the rest of the book is for the most part a detailed account of his activities and descriptions of his environs, the woods, Walden Pond and its inhabitants, both human and non-human animal and plant life. Some of it is a mundane and detailed, some will argue overly detailed, account of how he, for instance, built his home or plants his crops and supplementing his beans with some occasional trading and hunting and so on. But why does he go into such detail? It is because he is trying to show his reader that what he wants to do is not merely possible but to demonstrate through his example that he has gone and done it. You should realize that Thoreau is not a farmer by trade or a seasoned outdoorsman. He went to Harvard and studied what today are the liberal arts. His family had a pencil manufacturing business which he was a part of. He taught briefly at the school, had his own school, gave private tuition to the brother of his friend Ralph Waldo Emerson wrote and published his poetry, all before he headed to Walden Pond. This is not a man who knows a lot about agriculture or about living in the wild, though he is also not entirely unfamiliar with them. The point is, he is a novice at what he is about to embark on. He does not have it all figured out from the start, the way you would expect from a professional, an expert or someone with great experience. He made it up as he went along. He has never built a house before, but he builds his own dwelling, chopping his own wood to build its walls and roof. 
he plants enough beans for his own sustenance and then some. While his home was livable in warmer weather, he had enough sense to prepare it for the area's harsh winter. He tells us about all these, not because he is trying to give us a manual for home construction or living in the forest, but because he wants to prove to us by his example that it is possible to make such a retreat from human society and to show, not tell us, the simple and transformative joys that he harnessed from his experience. I don't know about you, but I am a city dweller, living in the densely built-up, highly urbanized, small yet busy country of Singapore. Going to the nature is a rare event for me. I have never camped alone, and even building a fire out of wood would be a novel experience for me. I had never done it, and I am not sure I know how to handle an axe well enough to chop up firewood, not to mention fell a tree. I have never hunted animals before. Gun ownership is highly restricted here, and so if I wanted to, I'll probably have to use a bow and arrow, which probably will also be considered a restricted weapon. I have fished perhaps three times in my entire life. I definitely have never grown crops, though I do have some plants at home, an apartment in a high-rise residential building. But even if I was an experienced outdoorsman, there is precious little nature that I could go and live in, and even that will require permits. To make such a retreat as Thoreau did into the wild is out of the question, at least within the boundaries of my country. Yet if that was my conclusion, then I may have completely missed the point of Warden. The journey that Thoreau made was in a way monumental, but really he was only a couple of miles away from his village. So it is not so much the distance or even where he went because the adventure he had was primarily a spiritual one. He discovered who he was, what he was made of, and took the time, the time he won by retreating from society and the paid labour he would have otherwise sold his time to. He carved out the space, both literally and figuratively, so as to ruminate, to meditate, and consider what life was, for himself and for people in general. He went to where it was peaceful so that he can be quiet within himself. Sure, he could not escape all labour since he had to literally build his shelter and then take care of his bodily needs of food and water. But precisely his point is that after he has taken care of these necessities, he still has enough capacity to reap a bounty of time and mental space to be quiet so he could think deeply. For a person who did not go about such an adventure intentionally, like one shipwreck on a desert island, perhaps having too much time to think deeply could be troubling and traumatic, but not to row. He wanted to set aside this period in his life to retreat from society so that he can look inward into himself and outward at the world, at the nature around him, to absorb and be absorbed in the moment, in this peaceful place. He wanted to really experience it, not in a hurried, scattered way, which we tend to do when we are on vacation to beautiful places, but in an unhurried, relaxed way, as one who knows that he has all the time in the world to slowly take it all in. Walden Pond and the woods around it sound nice enough, but it is not some award-winning beauty spot. If you happen to live nearby, it is a place you can go to enjoy some serenity in, but it is not something like the Grand Canyon, Mount Fuji, the Eiffel Tower, the Great Wall of China, or Machu Picchu, places where you would travel vast distances at great expense to see. But perhaps this is why Walden Pond was precisely the place for Toro to go for his retreat. If he went to Machu Picchu, then perhaps because he had spent a fortune to get there, he would also want to check out all the other sites and then instead of having peace and quiet to contemplate, he would be caught up in the novelty of the new place and be busy trying to maximise his vacation time. Walden, with its water, seasons and trees, reminds me of Leuven, a small town in Belgium where I had the privilege to study in for three years when I did my philosophy degree. It is a pretty little place, and if you just made a short cycle from where I was staying, within 10 minutes you would be in the countryside with farms, rivers, lakes, and a wide open sky. For those living in countries bigger than Singapore, which is most countries since Singapore is a small island state, you may not be able to imagine how it feels for me to experience such space. For most of us here, the view we have from our window is the building opposite. For me to see the sky from my window, I have to literally stick my neck out of the window and arch it upwards. The city is so bright that I've only seen a sky full of stars three times in my life and all three times were abroad. 
So you can understand that the countryside of Leuven is very precious to me, though in a way it isn't that unique. Like Walden, this countryside is probably not somewhere you would travel half the way across the world to see. It is the kind of view you get from just taking the train in Europe between cities. But to me, it is how I imagine Walden to be. Not just in terms of its landscape, but how it might have felt to Thoreau. It is not mind-blowingly spectacular or even that unique, but in its simple, common way, a woods with a pond is already like paradise. Thoreau's Walden is a real place, you can still visit it today. But what is important about it is not its physical location, but the state of mind that he achieved there. Walden is a state of mind. We can see this during an episode when he went to jail. Thoreau had on principle refused to pay the poll tax, as he did not like how the taxes were used to support the Mexican-American War and the expansion of slavery. He had not paid for six years when, during his time at Walden Pond, he encountered a policeman who was also the tax collector. He was arrested and put in jail, but was let out after one night when an unidentified lady believed to be his aunt paid the tax on his behalf. I did not for a moment feel confined, and the walls seemed a great waste of stone and mortar, he writes, in his landmark essay, Civil Disobedience. It was like travelling into a far country, such as I had never expected to behold, to lie there for one night. It seemed to me that I never had heard the town clock strike before, nor the evening sounds of the village. It was a closer view of my native town. I began to comprehend what its inhabitants were about. Even prison could not stop him from observing, contemplating, and living deliberately. The point is this. We may not have some kind of forest or beach or even a garden, but we can still make such a retreat as Thoreau did. We can still try to be calm and find some quiet, even if it is only for one week, to try to do what Thoreau did, to live deeply, to breathe in and appreciate the crispness of the air, to hear birds chirping and wonder if they are calling to each other out of love to listen to the rain on the window panes and be transported, to try to minimize our distraction, especially in this day and age where our devices are in our pockets, maybe even on our wrists, beeping and vibrating way too often that our attention is fragmented, to try to reflect, to try to figure out what is important to us, to live deliberately, not just swept up in the tide of humanity, taking the path of least resistance, floating along wherever the waters of life bring us. To me, the gift of this book, Walden, is that it tells us that someone really managed to go and live this life of contemplation, even if it was just for two years for Thoreau. In a way, he still is not that unique. Religious people obey their calling and enter monastic life. The image I have here are monks, nuns or priests who take up holy orders and enter their temples and monasteries to serve, meditate, study, pray and contemplate the face of God. What Thoreau did was kind of like a secular version of monastic life. It is a spiritual journey, in the sense that he is caring for his soul, his spirit. Today's version of Walden may be to travel to new places, but with enough time so as not to be caught up in the noble sights and sounds, but to have the frame of mind to soak in the experiences. Mountain climbers and hikers may find their Walden as they scale the heights. Just as Walden is an account of Thoreau's personal experience, I think what is needed when reading it is our own personal response. If one was not driven by Thoreau's account to reflect on one's own life, then the book would have missed its mark. To me, Walden is an inspiration. If a person like Thoreau, in many ways rather ordinary, can undertake this extraordinary journey, so can we. But unlike those who enter monastic orders, it is not a life of quietism. Instead, his two years at Walden Pond is a time of soul-searching, reflection and self-discovery where he was determined to follow his own way, to live life on his own terms, to be self-reliant, self-sufficient and independent from society and his mores. He took the time to figure things out, how he should live his life and what he cares about, to work out what is valuable to him. After he left the woods, he fought for what was important to him, participating in the struggle to abolish slavery by lecturing and writing against slavery and helping slaves escape on the Underground Railroad. His health was already deteriorating when fellow abolitionist John Brown, whom Thoreau regarded as a father figure, was hung for his role in the armed struggle against slavery. The psychological shock of Brown's execution may have hastened Thoreau's decline. 
only 44, Thoreau died of tuberculosis in 1862. He is remembered today for his literary contribution, in addition to his activism, his environmental consciousness and his love for nature. But even his failures cannot take away his passion for life. He was not financially successful. A virtual unknown during his lifetime, his books didn't sell well and his poems were published in marginal journals. I wonder what he would say if he was asked about this. I suspect that while he strove to be excellent in his writing and work, he also realised that whether he found material success or otherwise is something that depends on many factors including luck which is outside his control. I imagine that he did not court failure, but when it did happen, took it in his stride. After all, failure is also part of life, and to live deeply and suck out all the marrow of life means also experiencing the good and the bad. I started my essay with some lines from Walden, and I want to end with it also. I hope my rendition here have helped you understand now these words of Thoreau better. I went to the woods because I wished to live deliberately, to front only the essential facts of life, and see if I could not learn what it had to teach, and not, when I came to die, discover that I had not lived. Thank you.